Good morning uh, to each one of you. On behalf of Bangalore Chamber of Industry and Commerce, we welcome you all for this exclusive and important session on higher contributions to employee pension scheme, knowing more about the scheme. Uh, the session is organized under the aegis of uh, HR and Women Leadership Expert Committee. Um, we thank the team of the HR Expert Committee for structuring this uh, session. And the chamber uh, especially acknowledges the support of all the distinguished speakers, Mr. B.C. Prabhakar, uh, President Karnataka Employers Association, Radhika Vishwanathan, subject matter expert from Deloitte, Mr. T.R. Parshuraman, who is our uh, past president and executive advisor to Toyota Kirloskar Motor, Mr. Vinay Joy, partner Kaitan and Co., Ms. Saraswati Kasturi Rangan, Chief Happiness Officer, Deloitte, for accepting our invitation to be part of this session. Thank you very much once again. The Chamber acknowledges the support of our member organizations um, for their annual sponsorship for the events organized. Mrs. Bueller, Continental, Fundamax, IAMPL, MTR, SDMIMD, Sona Group of Companies, TVS Motor, Vishwas Group, and Wipro. Uh, thank you once again to all the participants for joining at this session. I would now hand over the platform to Dr. Augustus, who chairs our HR uh, expert committee. Uh, over to you, Dr. Augustus. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rupa, for uh, bringing this program together. And uh, good morning, friends. Uh, truly delighted to uh, see you all on a Monday morning and uh, for an important topic uh, as uh, this question about EPS contributions that continue to uh, run in our minds. We've had uh, different uh, advisors. We've had uh, various other people also talking about it. And there's been some fantastic takeaways around this topic. And uh, Mr. Parsuraman and I wanted to do this program about two or three months before. Uh, and that couldn't happen because certain officials from the government of India couldn't make it. But nevertheless, we said we should drive this program and Saraswati came up with this uh, plan to do it much before 26th, which is the day of implementation. Uh, so I'm truly uh, thankful to Saraswati and the team out here, an esteemed pa panel out here with our mentor, Mr. B.C. Prabhakar, uh, Mr. Parasuraman with his rich... Mr. Parsuraman, with his very rich experience in the industry. And of course, uh, you know, Vinay Joy, who brings in the legal perspective on it, uh, being a partner at Khetan and Company, and uh, also a great contributor to our HR uh, committee. And uh, Radhika Viswanathan, thank you for being here as the SME from Deloitte. And needless to say, we have achieved. You got it? Sorry. Okay. Needless to say, we have the Chief Happiness Officer from uh, Deloitte, um, Saraswati Kasturi Rangan, uh, whom I know for a very long time and whose commitment to the cause is truly much amazing. Much so without much ado, I would like to turn this over to Saraswati. Thank you. Thank uh, you just uh, only one uh, small thing. I think we also yes, recognize the presence of the former uh, Regional PF Commissioner, Mr. Narayan Kamarji. I just invited him. Oh, you know, I see. To join this meeting. Uh, so, oh, very nice. uh, Ati, welcome to you, sir. And also, I requested the current regional commissioner, Dr. Singh, you know, Mr. D.K. Singh. So he also said he will try to join, but I could see Mr. Kamar already joined. So, welcome, uh, Mr. Mr. Kamar. Mr. Kamar and I go back quite a few years, sir. Thank you so much for joining. It's uh, such a pleasure to see you here, and we are truly honored to have you on this uh, meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, so good morning, sirs, and uh, thank you, Augie. Uh, thank you, Mr. Par for Mr. Parasuram for calling out the presence of the uh, former commissioner. Very hearty welcome to you, uh, sir. Uh, I think, um, Augie, as you rightly said, the rationale for uh, having this conference um, at a short notice was given the importance of the topic, and I think it's clearly reflected in the attendance that we are seeing today on a Monday morning. Just to give a quick background, the Supreme Court way back in November 2022 issued a ruling and this ruling enabled employers, employees to opt for higher pension contribution. 
However, there were certain conditions in terms of who is eligible, what kind of contributions would need to be moved from the PF account and so on. And once this is done, then the employees would be eligible to higher pensions. It, and it's also important to understand that once the higher pension option is exercised, the same was irreversible. Hence, we felt that it is important for both employees and employers to be aware of the various aspects that are involved. And this would includes not only financial uh, implications, but also procedural aspects that one needs to be aware, aware of. Hence, we've tried to put together a wonderful uh, panel uh, here who will help us, who will take us through this journey of what the Supreme Court ruling said, what aspects are to be kept in mind, how do we look at the financial implications, what aspects you need to look at while the actual forms are being filled in. So we've tried to keep it as practical as possible. The importance is that this window is open only till 26, which is just about a week away, and hence the importance of this topic. Uh, I, I know, Augie, you've done a quick intro, so I'm not really going into the intro of all the panelists. I It's my pleasure to welcome a BCP, sir, uh, to provide the uh, opening context, setting the context and giving the opening remarks. It's honestly a privilege to have you talk on this topic, sir. Yeah, and, and just for the uninitiated, not that I expect anybody in um, the Bangalore group to be uh, uh, BCP sir is the is an eminent and senior advocate specialized in labor laws. He's been our mentor as Augie called out and uh, we are happy to have you with us sir. So uh, without further ado, let me pass it on to you give the to give the opening remarks. Sir. Thank you sir. Kuti. Thank you Mr. Augustus. Thank you Mr. Raman. Good morning to all the participants. Shubhodaya. But I'm happy that large of participants have joined for this uh, webinar. In fact, uh, for submission of uh, uh, forum under 26.6, the last date is 26.6. In this webinar, we the speakers are addressing certain pension pains. But friends, even though nearly seven months have elapsed since the judgment, of the Supreme Court, but there are several questions which the pensioners should get answers before deciding to opt for higher pension in terms of judgments of Supreme Court. And today's seminar will be organized by BCIC uh, to provide answer to the major questions concerning pensioners. But as all of you are aware, Bond Fund and Business Act came into force in, in March 1952, and in essence, it provides for creation of retirement fund for the benefit of the employees of industrial and commercial establishments. I don't want to go into details of the act because all of you know about it. But the pension scheme has applicable to industrial and commercial employees as a checkered history. I may note the changes that have taken place since 1971. On 1371, Bond of India notified family pension scheme, if all of you remember, it is FES. The scheme made provision for payment of pension to the family of the members of the EPF scheme who die, who die while in service only. The family pension fund was created by transferring 1.16% of the employer's and employer's contribution to the permanent fund. Government of India was also contributing 1.16%. The scheme provided only a very limited benefit to the members of the deceased member of the PF. So in the year, 1611.95, Government of India replaced the family pension scheme by the government to the provisions of the uh, EPA Act and introduced the employees' pension scheme. I will call it as EPS. At the relevant time, the salary limit for coverage under EPF scheme was rupees 5,000. Pension fund was contributed by diverting 8.3% of 12% or the employer's contribution only. Please note that employer's contribution only to the point fund. The government was also contributing 1.16% to the pension fund. The pension salary was to be calculated on the basis of the average salary down by the employee during the 12 months subject to the ceiling of 5,000 rupees only. Under the original scheme, there was no option to the employees to make contribution to pension fund over and above rupees 5,000. So in, on 16th 96, 
the scheme was amended, EPS scheme was amended, and FARA 11.3 was inserted. The amended provision provided that the employer and employee can exercise the option for contributing to the pension fund on salary over and above 5,000. That is the actual basic. The option for making higher contribution to the pension fund was to be exercised within six months from 1686, or from the date on which the employee's salary exceeded the statute limit of uh, 5,000 rupees. But majority did not exercise the option. The option is the subject matter of this uh, seminar, actually. Another seminar. On 1 6 2001, salary of 5,000 became 6,000 rupees. No other changes. But major change took place on 1 9 2014. The statute cell limit for coverage under this scheme was enhanced from 6,500 to 15,000 per month, and the amendment came into force from 1 9 2014. The consequence of the ever amendment is employees who join service after 1 9 2014 and who are not members of the EPF scheme earlier and whose basic salary is more than 15,000, they cannot become member of the pension scheme. So another notable amendment is that it introduced subpara 4, 11-4. Amended para of 11-4 also gave an option to the existing members of the pension fund. Uh, why? Uh, a pension fund to uh, opt for the higher this one. If, uh, and uh, it was uh, uh, required, in fact, uh, the fresh option was to be exercised within six months from 19 2016. Such members were required to contribute 1.16% of their salary exceeding 15,000 as additional contribution from and out of the contribution payable by the employer. The RPFC was empowered to extend the time limit by another six months if sufficient cost being shown by the members. So this is the main issue which is the subject matter of Supreme Court judgment also. If no option is made, they are very important. If no option is made within the prescribed time limit, including extended time, shall be deemed as no option when contribution made over and above the salary ceiling shall be diverted back to the bond fund with interest. So that is the provision. There were several employees from various states challenged through the 14 amendment and ultimately the case reached the Supreme Court in the case of APFO versus Sunil Kumar. But what are the main issues in that judgment? Because that will provide answer to all our issues. See, the calculation of pension salary at average pay of 60 months preceding the date of, date of exit, uh, exit instead of 12 months will reduce the pension amount. That was the main ground. Fixation of maximum pension salary ceiling of 15,000 rather than actual contribution would deprive the employees the decent pension. Fixation of time limit of six months for members to avail fresh option would defeat the purpose of the scheme. Additional payment of 1.16% by employees as additional contribution for members who want to contribute for more than statutory salary receiving limit. So that also a challenge. But the scheme will be applicable to the exempt establishments also. These are the questions. And uh, Supreme Court in a judgment dated 4-11-2022 Give the following directions. Fresh option to make higher contribution shall be exercised within the next four months of the judgment. That is from uh, around 4, 9, 22 to four months. And such of the available employees who had earlier contributed on actual salary and were members of the pension fund on or before 2014 and continue as member of a Pension fund after 1914. So, this is the qualification. They should have contributed earlier, continue to contribute on the higher salary. And uh, the employees must have contributed to the permanent fund on actual salary to exercise the option. So, there must be actual uh, contribution on actual uh, salary. And the judgment is, uh, bit, uh, is available to exempt establishments also. These are the four uh, points that Supreme Court uh, decided. In the light of the above, in fact, in the light of uh, uh, the Supreme Court judgment, who are eligible for availing the higher pension? One is uh, if employee in service as on 1914 
exercise option protected by EPFO, he is eligible to apply. Second category is employees in service as on 114 and employees in service as on 114 not exercise the option, but contribution continues. They can also apply. Third one is employees retired before 914. Exercise option but rejected. They can also apply. Employees retired before 914 but not exercise option. They cannot apply. Here are the four broad categories. So EPFO, EPFO department issued many guidelines after the judgment about the manner in which the employee should submit their claim for higher pension by those pensioners who are eligible to achieve higher pension in terms of the support judgment. But due to these dates, our questions arise as to how exactly the claim should be made. But that is the subject matter of this webinar. On 29, 1222, EPO released the guidelines for claiming higher pension in terms of the judgment Supreme Court. And again, on 20th February 2023, they released further instructions with regard to claiming of higher pension, particularly in respect to the employees who are retired from the service. Then uh, EPF also made available to the employees the facility to submit the option from through online mode by providing necessary links for the same on their website. They said the online forum was required that the copy of the permission under the 266 should be attached. In fact, uh, if, uh, if there is a uh, permission already given, that should be attached. So that is that is what the, uh, the website said. This created a lot of problem because nobody has opted. This class makes opting for higher pension nearly impossible. In fact, uh, in reply to a RTA question, the EPFO itself had admitted that no one had op submitted option before contributing to the pension fund on actual or higher salary. It was a fact that uh, without option, the contribution and actual salary was accepted by EPU. It is also there. The online forum raised several perplexing questions and issues. In fact, several representations were made by various associations. Even a number of a member of parliament raised the question before the parliament, but central government and EPU opposed stuck to their stand and refused to delete the column regarding attaching permission under paragraph 26. Interestingly, on 1423, in this year, April, on the High Court of Kerala, part an interim order that the EPFO should delete the column and provide a new online forum within 10 days. High Court also said if alteration cannot be uh, made in the online forum, permission should be given for hard copies to be submitted. But this was never acted upon, although the interim order is there. In subsequent circulars, no mention is made about Kerala judgment. Relatedly, in the month of June, on 2 6 and 12, 14 6, they issued two circulars. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, they issued a series of guidelines for uploading the application for higher pension. On the specific guideline was that the claimant should upload the joint option and permission granted by the EPFO. In accordance with the in, the, in accordance with the, the panel 26 6, which most of them had uh, not uh, uh, taken. No, for, no further, the guidelines stipulate that the above shall uh, Validation of option, joint options received from applicants from PF exam establishments as well. The same manner. In this context, object of option is to submit is June 26. Important note that in whole process, there is no financial liability on the employer. One point. Employer's contribution of higher wages is compulsory. It is also important to note that submission of option under para 26 of the EPF scheme for claiming higher pension. Is mandatory. Existing employees who are already contributing an higher salary should also exercise the option on or before 26.6. It is also uh, said that, and they have also been given, uh, uh, say, at the time of retirement, also they can do it. But the question is uh, suppose somebody dies uh, in between, 
So if there is no option, there will be difficulty. Therefore, better they all take this option, uh, not itself. Most of you are aware that the current debate among the employees is how to claim higher pension in terms of support judgment. In this webinar, we are addressing all the questions that arose and the way forward as to how the claim for higher pension can be made, who should make the claim, calculation of higher pension, what are the legal perspectives, financial implications and process to be followed. In fact, industry and industry perspective also is being given. All these will be debated by other speakers, Mr. Vinay Joy, Ms. Ms. Radhika Vishwanathan and uh, T.R. Prashwaman. In fact, I am happy that Mr. Narayan Kham also has joined. He can also throw some uh, uh, see, light on this issue. So I thank BCAC and uh, women's, uh, HR and Women's uh, Empowerment Committee for giving me this opportunity. And I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think you actually summarized the whole one hour discussion uh, in the last uh, 10 minutes. So thank you so much for that. And I think you've also called out the challenges and the open questions that are there. We will deliberate on that a little more. Uh, let me just pass on to Mr. Vinay Joy, uh, partner Kaitan and Co. Um, uh, of course, Vinay, uh, thanks for joining in your uh, no, your experience and expertise in this matter is really going to um, give us a good insight in terms from the legal perspective. So when I just pass it on to you, Vinay, and if the slides are there, please do feel free to put them up. I think there is some question on whether the slides are there. Uh, if you could take us through what did the Supreme Court ruling actually say, who is eligible for this benefit and clarify on the legal aspects, that would be very helpful. Over to you, Vinay. Right. Thank you, uh, Saraswati. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Give me just a second. I am just putting up my slides. Uh, is everyone able to see my slides? Yes. Yes. Right. All right. So uh, I think BCB sir has already sort of taken us through the entire topic, and you know there will be some overlap in what I will be talking about as well. But uh, you know, hopefully, you will bear with that. Um, I think just to start off by recapping the history, uh, I think as all of you are aware, you know, we have a Provident Fund Act that has a Provident Scheme uh, as well as an Employees Pension Scheme. And primarily, uh, everyone's aware that you need to contribute, say, 12% contribution is made by the employer, 12% contribution is made by the employee. Um, I think what some of you also would know is that uh, to the pension scheme, it's only the employer's portion of the contribution that actually goes flows into the pension scheme. And from the 12%, basically 8.33 goes into the EPS and the balance 3.67 then goes into the employee provident fund scheme. Now, uh, I think like BCP sir was saying, you know, under the erstwhile uh, uh, pension scheme, uh, there was a paragraph six that sort of uh, provided that anyone who became a member of the EPF scheme would also automatically become a member of the uh, EPS scheme. And at that point, of course, you know, your pensionable salary was calculated as being the average monthly pay drawn during the service period of 12 months immediately preceding the employee's exit. Now, at that point, uh, you know, as BCP sir said earlier, the threshold used to be 5,000. It was then raised to 6,500 in uh, November 95. Uh, so the maximum pensionable salary was capped at 6,500 per month, uh, but it also allowed for the contribution to be made as per actual salary. Uh, provided that a joint option was then made. Now, uh, from 95 to 2014, that was what sort of applied. And then we came up to uh, the EPS amendment scheme of 2014, um, which then changed the applicability to include members of the EPF scheme whose monthly salary was less than or equal to 15,000 rupees. Uh, also, it changed the methodology of calculation in terms of pensionable salary was to be the average monthly salary drawn during the contributory period of service in the 60 months uh, prior to the date of the employee's exit. And again, just uh, like the like previously, while the maximum pensionable salary was capped at 6,500 per month, it was now capped at uh, 15,000 rupees per month. Now, uh, the option of contribution on a monthly salary exceeding 15,000 was allowed upon making a fresh option, uh, which was meant to be a joint option between the employer and the employee. And this needed to be exercised within a period of six months uh, from 1st of September 2014. Uh, the amendment scheme also sort of provided that 
employees were required to contribute an additional 1.16% of the salary exceeding 15,000 as an additional contribution towards the EPF scheme towards managing their charges. Now, uh, this, uh, I mean, in fact, uh, interestingly, before I go on to what thereafter happened in, in 2019, uh, the EPFO actually pa passed a circular uh, in January, uh, which admitted that, you know, a lot of people may not have actually filed those joint options under 26.6 of the EPF scheme uh, and were actually contributing on higher wages uh, than the prescribed statutory limit, but that, uh, you know, it, the EPFO had been accepting them. And so it sort of uh, gave directions to the regional offices suggesting that uh, for those employees for whom it was, that was indeed the case, uh, the joint option may be inferred from this practice itself and a separate document confirming the joint option may not be insisted upon. Now, uh, thereafter, there was this Kerala High Court judgment uh, in the case of P. Shashikumar, uh, which actually set aside the EPS amendment. I mean, uh, facts were that a lot of workers had approached uh, the Kerala High Court suggesting that uh, the EPS amendment scheme was actually faulty uh, because it prescribed these limitations on who could sort of participate in the scheme. Uh, the notion that, you know, the, the capping at 15,000 was actually unrealistic uh, because it didn't actually match with uh, what was actually the norm in terms of what where salaries were going, etc. Uh, so the Kerala High Court actually accepted a bunch of uh, their arguments and set aside the EPS amendment on the grounds that the EPF Act doesn't allow uh, for one, the additional interest of 1.16%. Uh, the EPF scheme did not did not have, the Act itself did not have a provision uh, that allowed for the authority to actually sort of provide for such charges to be levied. Uh, and also for providing a cutoff date for getting benefits under the EPS scheme was held to be invalid. Now this cutoff date referred to the six month period within which the option would have had to be uh, you know, enforced. Uh, and I think I'll just draw you to the next bullet point with respect to R.C. Gupta, because it act the Kerala High Court actually relied on the judgment in R.C. Gupta, which also said that, uh, you know, that the time limit specified under Para 11.3 for contributing EPS on higher salaries was not meant to be valid, as you could not provide for a cutoff time period for exercise of benefits under a beneficial legislation. So that same principle was applied and the Kerala High Court sort of set aside the scheme. Uh, following that, in uh, 7 February 2019, the EPFO actually withdrew the circular of 22 January uh, because it believed that the uh, EPS amendment had been sort of set aside. Now, these judgments were actually appealed to the Supreme Court in the case of uh, Sunil Kumar, uh, which uh, uh, Mr. Prabhakar also mentioned. Now, this is the relevant judgment which was passed of last year. Uh, I should also make a mention that, in fact, once the EPFO actually appealed uh, from the Kerala High Court's judgment, initially the Supreme Court was not willing to hear it and it actually tossed out the SLP, uh, which was actually filed uh, and which was to meant to give certainty. But I think on subsequent appeal, uh, the Supreme Court then sort of heard the case on merits and then sort of gave out this judgment in uh, November. Now, the key takeaways from this judgment uh, were that, of course, the court held that uh, while it said that the Kerala High Court setting aside the EPS amendment was not valid as it was a valid and legal exercise of power, which was exercised by, uh, you know, the EPF authorities and the government in sort of framing uh, the amendment scheme. And so that was, there was no illegality with respect to that. Uh, it also suggested that the restriction on membership to the EPS on a wage ceiling of 15,000 rupees was permissible. Uh, it included the imposition of a cutoff date for opting for higher contribution as not being acceptable and actually provided for an additional four months from the date of the judgment to actually then get the benefits. So basically ruling out that the six month period for exercise of the option was uh, sort of invalid and sort of sort of limited the benefit under the scheme. Uh, they've sought to provide an additional four months from November uh, 22 uh, to be able to exercise the benefits and get the benefit of that even for past periods. Now, uh, it also suggested that the requirement of, you know, providing for this additional contribution of 1.16% of the monthly salary exceeding 15,000 rupees was ultra virus, again, because there was no provision in the EPF uh, Act that allowed for this. Uh, but they also suggested that suitable legislative amendments could be made to actually sort of bring that in. And therefore, this part of the judgment, 
uh, that they passed, they sort of kept that on hold for six months. Uh, the idea effectively being that it was actually a window of six months provided to the government uh, to be able to sort of formulate, uh, you know, uh, a law or a ruling to sort of bring about uh, validity for that 1.16% to be charged. Uh, and lastly, it also suggested that benefits of the EPS amendment would now apply to employees of exempted establishments as well. Exempted establishments being those who obtain an exemption from the applicability of the schemes on the ground that the benefits that they provide are actually uh, commensurate or better than what are provided for under the scheme. But given that the uh, EPF amendment, EPS amendment scheme would have allowed for workers to actually contribute on a higher contribution, the idea was that exempted establishments could also sort of uh, look to make use of that uh, additional higher wage ceiling and in which case they would all the employees in those establishments would also be covered by this amendment. Now, coming to the implications of this uh, for one, uh, I mean, I think and one of the things that comes up very regularly is for new employees who join the workforce, etc. A lot of them earn higher than 15,000 rupees uh, per month, etc. What happens with respect to them? Technically, while the judgment doesn't go into that, but the suggestion then appears to be that employees who are earning higher above these thresholds would technically not be eligible to sort of join the EPS at all. And so none of these actually impacts uh, them. Uh, members of the EPS uh, who as of 95 uh, had opted to contribute on higher salary and who continue to remain in service as of 1st September 2014 would automatically be considered to have opted for the higher contribution per the EPS amendment. And lastly, members of the EPS as of 1st September 2014 who could not opt for higher contributions per the EPS amendment, either because they did not make the option or having applied for the option, uh, the same was refused. They have a, you know, four months from the date of the judgment, uh, which currently as Saraswati and BCP sir said, both said 26 June 23. Uh, that's actually now the timeline because it kept getting pushed out. It was before this, that cutoff date was 3rd May, etc. Uh, but because I think for implementation of, you know, these joint options and how that needs to be recorded, etc. Uh, you know, this needs to be spread off across the entire country. I think more and more time is being taken, uh, but currently 26 June 23 uh, is that cutoff date uh, which has been prescribed. Now, with respect to, of course, uh, further developments uh, in this regard, then, uh, you know, uh, like uh, on 29th December 22, there was an EPF uh, circular that laid out the details of employees who were eligible to claim this higher pension benefit, uh, which is those who had contributed under the EPF scheme on their entire salary above the extant monthly wage limit, which would have been 5,000 or 6,500, etc., as the case may have been. Uh, those who have exercised their joint option under the EPS scheme prior to this EPS amendment to contribute on a salary exceeding 6,500, and those whose exercise of such option was declined by the provident fund authorities. So effectively, this is the distillation process in terms of what the EPFO did reading Sunil Kumar's judgment they arrived at the conclusion that these are the sort of uh, kind of employees who would be eligible to actually make uh, a claim for higher pension benefit. And it was only their applications which would then need to be considered. Now, in 25 January 23, uh, there was another EPFO circular that provided for uh, a re-examination of cases of uh, payment of pension on higher salary for those who had retired before September 1, 2014 without exercising the option. Now, it's interesting that these sort of category of employees was actually specifically stated in the Sunil Kumar case as not, you know, those who would get the benefit of this. So we're not entirely sure on the EPFO's uh, motive for sort of uh, issuing that particular circular. Uh, however, in uh, April 23, uh, like uh, BCP sir said, there was this interim order passed in the case of Sahir uh, and others versus the Union of India, where again, I think, uh, I think the practical on ground reality uh, that was brought before the Kerala High Court by uh, various associations was the fact that uh, the EPFO had not been mandating joint options to be submitted and most establishments had actually not sort of followed that process at all. They had simply been contributing higher uh, sort of, uh, you know, making contributions on higher salaries and the EPFO had been accepting them. And with that being the case, they were asked that those employees not be prejudiced because they had not actually made a joint option earlier. So the Kerala High Court passed an interim order uh, directing that 
you know, in those instances, uh, the proof of the same of a joint option may not be necessary uh, to now furnish a new option in line with the EPFO circulars. They also mandated that the uh, EPFO in sort of uh, because some of its circulars had already sort of looked to prescribe, uh, you know, a joint option. Those forms could be amended to actually bring it in line uh, to cover for this uh, set of employees as well. Now, on 3rd May uh, in 2023, the a couple of notifications were passed by the Ministry of Labor and Employment. Uh, one was, of course, uh, you know, the main one is that this additional contribution of 1.16 uh, percent uh, on contribution that is to be borne by the employer, uh, which would effectively mean that now rather than 8.33 percent up to 9.49 percent of the basic wages, dearness allowance and retaining allowance exceeding 15,000 rupees per month would now be contributed into the uh, pension scheme for the employee. This would also have retrospective effect in that it would be calculated as at 1st September 2014. Uh, and therefore, there would be a consequent reduction in the contribution to the employee's provident fund scheme uh, down from 3.67 uh, to 2.51 percent. Now, that was one set one set of notifications. The other notification, of course, uh, you know, talked about these schemes uh, being brought under the aegis of the Social Security Code, which has been uh, notified. Uh, the Social Security Code, as you might know, looks to repeal the provisions of the Provident Fund Act as well. And therefore, uh, what I think the notification did was to sort of uh, continue the applicability of the EPS scheme and uh, for the next year, for, uh, for a period of one year now. Uh, and effectively, the idea being that uh, what thereafter the EPFO has also done is that they have set up specific committees to sort of relook into the EPF scheme as well as the EPS scheme uh, going forward under the Social Security Code. So may not be relevant for our discussion here today, but that was the other notification passed on the same day. Uh, and lastly, there have been a couple more circulars passed by the EPFO on the 2nd of June as well as the 14th of June, uh, which sort of provided for the formats to make that joint request. Uh, you know, even those who have been making higher contributions without having made a joint option earlier are now required to follow this process. And of course, the notification from 14th June also provides for a list of documents to be submitted, which includes wage details or salary slips uh, and the joint request, etc. Uh, uh, to be submitted. Uh, so these have been the subsequent developments in this matter. I think obviously, uh, you know, the case that uh, remains to be seen really is uh, with respect to the implementation and whether this 26-6 date will be followed. I think as, uh, as as it shows, you know, the latest circular has been issued only on 14th of June. And uh, there is very little time now to sort of give action to a lot of this. And there are still lots of questions about eligibility and who sort of qualifies for this or not. But uh, to be fair, I think the Sunil Kumar judgment very clearly sort of laid out the parameters for who is eligible and who is not. And I think uh, a lot will also go down uh, more from a procedural standpoint in terms of at the EPFO, how have their records sort of maintained with respect to these extra contributions, etc. Because they will have to sort of update uh, each employee's records to reflect uh, a shift from, uh, particularly for those employees who have, who fall within that bucket of, you know, uh, who were actually contributing earlier, but had not made a joint option. If they now make that joint option because it becomes retrospective back from 1st September 2014, effectively what will happen is a portion of their EPF scheme amounts will need to be moved into the EPS scheme. Uh, and that is where I think there might be some confusion. I can only hope that there are no software glitches or anything in the EPF system and all of that runs smoothly. Uh, but uh, I guess, uh, you know, I'll come to an end of my presentation. I'll hand over, I suppose, to Radhika, who's, who will take you through those procedural uh, matters in more detail. Yeah, thanks, uh, Vinay. That's really been an exhaustive. I could say I could almost see the story of the EPIs coming out through all those circulars. So thanks for that uh, very sequential kind of um, presentation where you took us through the journey. Uh, and clearly, by now, I think we know that there is um, there is a set of population who are eligible for this higher pension benefit. Whoever is eligible can make at the choice within this window, which is going to expire by 26th of June. We also know that there is a retroactive contribution required into the EPS scheme, which means that there are funds which are going to move from your PF account to the pension account, including interest. But 
how exactly would this get impacted? What is going to be the financial implication? What are the aspects you need to keep in mind when you determine ex determine whether to exercise the choice or not? Because remember, it is irreversible. Once you exercise your choice, you're in for it for um, a life. And also understand what are the steps to be followed. And for that, I do have Radhika with me. Radhika is a subject matter expert um, from Deloitte. She's been with uh, Deloitte for over 17 years. Now she leads the social security initiator for Deloitte nationally uh, and she's a pro on the su subject. I can vouch for that. So uh, Radhika, over to you. Uh, uh, please do share the financial aspects and the practical uh, steps uh, and I'm sure that will be useful for our participants. Over to you. Uh, Saraswati, you. Uh, sorry to interrupt Radhika, just uh, 30 seconds. I want to also announce uh, that uh, Mr. D.K. Singh, the RPFC, has just joined us. And uh, moderator, uh, depending on the time, he would also like to share a few slides. So, uh, Saraswati, please uh, make sure that we are able to accommodate Mr. D.K. Singh. Thank you so much, sir, for coming on a Monday morning. We know that you have a tight schedule. Truly appreciate your presence here. Certainly. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Uh, We'll make sure your... that no, we get to hear you. Uh, it's very, very important. Mr. Singh, you can welcome. come on the video. I also welcome Mr. Singh. He's a very knowledgeable person and a very helpful officer. And we meet him always to listen to us and uh, help us in solving the problem. And uh, I'm sure he'll provide uh, good guidelines for us. Welcome, sir. Sir, we are waiting to see you on the video. Pardon? Uh, he's not able to switch on the camera. Uh, sir, uh, I put your... Uh, sir, uh, we are just wondering that link you're able to open, sir. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Sir, uh, can I put uh, my uh, speakerphone? Can you talk from here? Yeah, 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 sir. Then uh, we will request uh, Mrs. Saraswati to continue. Then uh, probably you can join us. Sir. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yes, some challenges in uh, getting the audio on and the video, but he's able okay. to see us and hear us. Very, very unfortunate. Okay, so okay I know that's unfortunate. Again, but let uh, us hope uh, the technology glitch is resolved. So let us go on in the interest of time. Radhika, over to you. And uh, uh, once he, once Mr. Singh comes in, we'll definitely want to hear from him as well. Uh, so Radhika, over to you. Sure. Uh, thanks, Saraswati. Good morning, everyone. Hope I'm audible and my slides are visible. Yes. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so I will not go into the legal aspects. We heard VCP, sir, and Vinay cover that uh, in their... Uh, presentations. So just trying to put some numbers to the legal aspects. Uh, first of all, on the asset status. So we know that 8.33% of the employer contribution goes towards pension and the rest comes to the Provident Fund account. So if an individual has a monthly basic of 25,000, how would it be? This is the current status when the individual has not opted for the higher pension option. And then I will move to how it will change when you have the higher pension option, which is exercised. So here the employee contribution of 12% will go entirely towards PF and that is 3000 rupees. The employer contribution out of that 8.33% capped at 15,000 rupees. The monthly basic is capped at 15,000 because that is the current statutory limit. So we have 1,250 rupees, which will get diverted to pension fund. And the remaining 1,750 goes to the employee's provident fund account. Now, if an individual opts for higher pension, how will the situation change? From the employee contributions, the 12% continues to go entirely towards provident fund. Now, this is after the clarification, the amendment from the uh, EPFO, wherein they said the additional 1.16 will also be carved out from the employer contributions and not from the employee contribution. This is in furtherance to the Supreme Court uh, ruling itself, where they had said you need to come out with the uh, legal changes to warrant this provision. So as a result, there will be no diversion from the employee contributions. The entire amount will go towards Provident Fund. 
from the employer contribution, earlier we saw 1,250 rupees goes towards pension fund and the balance towards provident fund. Now, if an individual opts to contribute to pension on higher salary, the amount that will get diverted to pension will be 2,199. How will it be higher? Because of this additional 1.16% on the differential of 10,000, which gets carved there. So, in effect, the contribution towards provident fund will get reduced from 1,750. It will now become 801. So, totally, if you see, the total contribution towards PF will show a decrease from 4,750 in the present situation to 3,801. However, the pension contribution or the allocation will increase from 1,250 to 2,199. Now, how will this impact your monthly pension? Pensionable salary in this scenario B will be 25,000, which is the higher salary. Assuming a person has put in 30 years of pensionable service, the monthly pension will be 10,710 as against 6,430 if it were to be computed on the statutory limit of 15,000. Now that is around a 66% increase from the scenario A where it is on wage saving. So that is the impact which a person will see on the monthly pension if they choose to opt for higher salary. This is a very, very simplistic example without taking the additional factors which can have a bearing. And I will touch upon what are the additional factors also which one may have to consider while they evaluate their individual situations. Because there is no one rule that fits all in this particular situation. There could be specific factors influencing each one's situation and therefore they will have to take their situations into consideration before they make a final decision. I will not touch this slide because we have heard BCP sir and Vinay uh, dwell upon who is eligible to exercise the option. So I will move on to what are the implications and what factors should be considered. Now, when I talk about the financial implications, first thing is there is going to be a reduction in the PF accumulations because the amount will have to be diverted retrospectively from the PF account to pension. And along with it, the interest which is credited to the member's account will also be transferred from PF to pension. Now, one should bear in mind that if it is in my PF account, it is against my name. Whereas when it is moved to pension, it goes to the corpus and it is not earmarked to the employee. However, the individual member will be entitled to an increased monthly pension, as we saw in our example in the previous slide. Uh, another point which is to be considered is if there is a withdrawal which has happened, a member has taken an advance uh, from their PF balance for certain purposes, there could be a situation where they have insufficient balance uh, when they choose to opt for this higher pension. In that case, they may have to cut out a check or make the payment through their last employer, depending on the directions from the EPFO. So there will be a cash flow issue which will have to be factored in this particular situation. The other point is while PF withdrawals are generally tax exempt, pension is taxable at the applicable slab rates for the individual. So that is also something which has to be taken care of. Now, there are some other factors which could be unique to each individual and which can have a bearing on the decision they make, whether they want to continue the present situation status quo or they want to go and exercise the option for higher pension contributions. Uh, some of it I touched upon are the tax rate. The other points would be what is the present age of the member? How many years of service do they have left? Uh, what is the salary hike that they expect for annum? How is the industry trend like? What could be the interest rates which will be notified on an annual basis? Earlier we saw rates as high as 10%, 9%, then now it is at 8%. Uh, what will be the expected return on the lump sum PF balance? Uh, then factor the time value of money. Then uh, last but not the least, whether there are any health issues which could impact or impede the life expectancy of the individual. Here you will also have to factor the life expectancy of the spouse because the spouse is also eligible for family pension. So you have to evaluate taking it into aggregate. These are some of the factors that we have listed. There could be a few more, uh, but these came at the top of our mind and listed these. And when you do an evaluation based on that, you will get a rough estimate or understanding of where you stand and whether you can go for the higher pension option or not. Uh, it is not a foolproof calculation, but 
and estimate taking into account some of the factors that I have listed above. So I've put together an illustration. If you can see on this slide, scenario A is uh, computing pension where the contributions capped on wage ceiling and scenario B is where the contributions are on higher salary. Some of the input parameters where we see is uh, there is a life expectancy, which is 74 years. The salary at the time of joining is 20,000 rupees. Uh, the annual increment is 6 percent. P of rate, we've taken it at 8 percent, tax at 10 percent and an 8 percent for time value of money. Now, if you see there is no change between scenario A and scenario B in the employee PF contributions. That is because of the clarification and the amendment also which has been brought in where they've specifically called out that the additional 1.16 percent will move from the employer contribution. And there you see that the employer contribution drops from 10 lakhs to around 3.3 lakhs. Also, the interest will also get reversed as I called out. Therefore, that goes down from 29.7 lakhs to 21.2 lakhs. Overall, if you see, there is a 16 lakh dip in this particular illustration. That will be the amount which will get transferred at the time of retirement. Now, coming to the calculation of pensionable salary, in the scenario A, where it is on wage ceiling, your pensionable salary will be 15,000 rupees. Whereas in scenario B, at the time of retirement, pensionable salary will be 63,450, applying the formula that is given. And pensionable service in this case is 24 years. Therefore, the monthly pension, if you see in scenario A, it is 5,140, whereas in scenario B, it is showing almost a fourfold increase. And after tax, there is a higher monthly pension at around 19,575. Now, if I factor the life expectancy into a consideration here, the total pension post tax that the individual can expect over their lifetime in scenario A is around 9 lakhs, in scenario B is around 38 lakhs. So again, you see a fourfold increase in this. If you take the total benefits in absolute terms, uh, then in scenario A, it is 62.24 lakhs. This is the PF plus the pension value. And then in scenario B, it is a higher number. Scenario B is a clear winner in this case also. If you try to bring it to the present value, applying the present value factor, scenario B still is marginally higher by around 50,000 rupees. And at 20, in financial year 22 23, say that individual decides now that yes, I will file the joint option application. I want to move to the higher pension option. So the estimated amount that will have to be transferred from their PF account to pension will be around 8,70,592. Now, this is assuming all these input factors in this particular situation. If I change even one parameter in this, then the answer would be very different. For instance, if I change the present value factor to say 4% or 3%, uh, then you could see scenario A proving better, or if I switch it a little more, then the numbers will change drastically. So it's depending on each individual situation, what is their risk appetite, uh, whether they want a steady stream of income, uh, what is the life expectancy for their individual case. All of these will go to play a role in deciding whether they want to contribute, take the option for higher pension or continue with status quo. Now, Radhika, if, I uh, think we have Mr. Singh in. Uh, sure. Sir, uh, would you like to come in with your comments and then we can continue? Are you uh, are you okay, no. sir? I think let her continue. I am uh, really liking the presentation. So please, anyway, thank you all for inviting me. I am here for some time. So please continue, ma'am. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, sir. you for joining. Uh, Radhika, over to you. Sure. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so on the process, first is uh, find out whether as a member you're eligible for filing the application itself or not, for filing the joint option application. Uh, BCP, sir, and Vinay called out who is eligible. And uh, once you find out whether you are eligible, then you have to do an evaluation of the cost benefit, uh, whether stay, continuing the status quo will be more beneficial in your particular case, or you think taking the joint option, uh, option is going to be more beneficial. Now, we also have a calculator which is available in the PF website itself, 
which gives an estimate of the amount which may have to be transferred from PF account to pension. So you can download that and do a quick check for your particular situation, punching your actual salary numbers also. That will also help in giving you a financial uh, estimate. Once you decide, yes, I'm eligible and I do want to go uh, for the joint option, then you collate all the data and the supporting documentation that is required. When I say data and supporting documentation, it will be, first of all, your AUAN, your ADA, your uh, PF passbook, uh, then your salary slips, because all these will be required to be uploaded. Then uh, if you have a 26X, we have dwelled in detail on that. If you have that request, then that will be needed. Else you can take an undertaking from your employer on the salary and the contributions to PF, which you have done. And uh, then there is also a couple of undertakings which you will have to uh, give while filing the joint option form through the online portal. I will share the screenshots for that along with the URL in the subsequent slides. Fill the joint option form, provide the declarations, submit it. Once you submit, there will be a message for successful uh, uploading of the form. If you have multiple employers, there will be a message which says it has been sent to all the employers for endorsement. You will get an acknowledgement number for your reference and future tracking as well. So please note that down and then you can monitor it. So this is how it appears in the EPFO portal. There is an option for submission of the file, a uh, higher op pension option filing. So please go exercise that, click here. There is a separate uh, tab for those who have retired prior to September 2014. Once you uh, click, you will get the screen where you have to enter your basic uh, personal details like UAN, your name, date of birth, Aadhaar. And, uh, there is an Aadhaar enabled uh, authentication and then you have to go to the subsequent screens where you provide your bank account details and you also give a confirmation whether the PF contributions have been done on wages exceeding the statutory wage ceilings as applicable from time to time. From the day your salary actually exceeded that particular limit, because if you had your salary which was lower than the statutory limit, uh, then you will contribute to PF on that particular salary and from the time it exceeds on that higher limit. So this you will have to give the declaration, then submit uh, confirm on the undertakings. There is a series of nine points which you will have to read and confirm. Some of these are like, you have read the Supreme Court judgment in the case of Sunil Kumar, which uh, I actually deliberated in detail, and you understand what it means to you. And you also understand that the central government is empowered to make changes to the uh, scheme, they, uh, which could mean uh, as they may deem fit, so uh, there is one doubt which is floating and I will uh, also raise this whether the computation of pension can be changed at a later point of time. We do have a circular from the APFO where they have given the computation mechanism, but there is a word there which says for now, which is actually uh, giving rise to some ambiguity or a question whether this will be changed in future. And then uh, you also agree that you will pay all the amount dues as directed by the APFO, either through your last employer or you agree to transfer from the accumulated balances. Once you give the declarations, then you submit the form and then you get the acknowledgement. There is an option now that the APFO is enabled wherein you can delete if you think you have made any errors and then you can file a fresh application. Only catch there is the employer should not have acted upon it and validated that option option which you have submitted. If the employer has actually acted upon it, then the delete and resubmit option is not available. From an employer perspective, once it hits their login, they will scan through the application, see if the data provided is right for the employment with them. And then they have a TXT file which has to be uploaded. Here you will have to provide monthwise details of wages and the contributions made along with interest. So that has to be submitted by the employer and then it goes to the EPFO for processing. Again, if the EPFO finds that there is some mismatch in data or there is some error, they will send it back to the employer along with the details of the error and give the employer an opportunity to correct the same. If everything is in order, then there is a speaking order which will be passed wherein the amount that will have to be transferred will be provided. 
So uh, this is broadly the process for submitting the application and processing by the EPFO at their end. Uh, so this with you, I hope I've covered the, the financial implications and process back to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that detailed uh, discussion, Radhika. And I, I would just want to dwell on that one aspect where there is a question as to whether the pension calculation, is it going to remain the way it is? There has been a circular which came out, which came out in 1st of June, which talked about the fact that um, for a pension, um, for those who were earning pension prior to 1st September 2014, the pensionable salary would be average of 12 months. For those uh, who are earning pension um, or where the pension eligibility is after 1st September 2014, the pensionable salary calculation will be based on 60 months. And there is a word, as Radhika rightly pointed out, saying that for now, this is how it would be. So, the, and given the declaration that you called out, Radhika, there is definitely a question as to is there going to be a change in pension at a later point in time? Uh, so, I would pause here. Uh, I think we've called out the key aspects and and the practical uh, um, aspects which we need to look at um, I do want to get uh, you in sir um, and I would also want to get comments from uh, um, you know Mr. T.R. Parsharaman executive director uh, Toyota Kirloska Motors so your insights from a practical perspective as to how the industry is reacting would also be uh, very very relevant um, yeah, thank you. So, thank you, sir. Suzuki. I also recognize the presence of uh, our good friend, uh, uh, Mr. D.K. Singh, the current uh, regional uh, PF commissioner. Thank you, sir, for joining us in a short notice. And uh, Mr. Narayan Kama, again, uh, great uh, support to industry, our uh, previous commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Narayan Kamarji. Welcome, and Mr. Narayan. Uh, nice uh, to connect with you again, this, sir. Uh, seminar. In fact, uh, you talked about a very, very interesting point about pro rata, which means the people uh, who have been eligible to get pension mm -hmm. before 2014, uh, the calculation will be based on the last uh, one year, basically from 2013 September to 14 September, and the people retiring after 2014 September, it will be five years. But uh, when I was talking to the commissioner, there was a divided opinion. In fact, the formula currently still it is working on a pro rata, immaterial of whether you're retiring now or earlier. So definitely I will reserve that comment to Mr. Singh, you know, during his address. So I'm just uh, requesting, should I talk about the industry point or should we uh, take the comments from both the commissioners? You know, since, uh, you know, they need to also catch up with other meetings. So yes, uh, probably, sure, sir. Yeah, I would, uh, you know, uh, give my industry perspective a little bit later. Now, sure, I would sir. request uh, Mr. S uh, Dikhi Singh to share your perspective, sir. Then also from Mr. Narayan Kamar, you know, so that, you know, for the benefit of industry, because two stalwarts are there, and then I think uh, we can uh, throw open some of the questions to audience also, if it is fine with you. Sure, sir. Over to you, uh, sir, uh, Mr. Singh, if you could give us your thoughts, comments, and what you're seeing, and how do you think... Uh, this should be taken forward by the industry. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. <clears throat> As I am already introduced, I am DK Singh, and one of my very senior colleagues is also part of this. I have a lot of respect for you, Mr. Narayan Kama, sir. So good afternoon, sir. This is DK Singh here. Uh, actually, let me begin with you know uh, saying a little bit of some some theoretical some theory about the pension fund and the pension scheme because uh, that is important. See, we as an individual, we have our own calculations. You know, we think that whatever we are going will come back to us or something like that. But before that, we have to understand the nature of the fund where it is going. And what is the nature of the scheme? What is the design of the scheme? The setup of the scheme. So that is very important. See, pension fund, as you all know, it came in 95. The provident fund scheme came in 1952. In between, there was a family pension scheme. 1971 and uh, when the pension fund came it did not come and uh, the nature of the fund the nature of the pension fund is totally different from the nature of the provident fund pension fund is a collective fund it's a pooling fund whatever you are 
depositing or your contribution are being diverted from the provident fund is actually getting merged it's a melting pot fund all contributions come at one place and then the performance of the fund depends upon the investment and all and it's about the corpus performance it's not about your individual's account performance so it's not that ki whatever you deposit will come back to you it depends upon the performance of the corpus as such because your role remains only till you contribute after contribution it gets merged it becomes a collective fund and uh, my money will go back go to your to you a, a money will go to b b money will go to c c to d like that and uh, this is how the nature of the fund is so we have to keep that in mind when we are doing any any we are, when we are taking decision regarding this so i will come to that later but first let me just run through the supreme court judgment i have two three slides to share so i will just run through it can is is not allowing to share or uh rupa if you're online uh, it's uh, has sharing rights been given uh, to sir it has been given sir swati so i need right. to click Thank on you. share content huh? just but that's correct sir mm -hmm. So share content, and if you can do desktop also, that'll be easier. Or you can do screen and then put the right screen up. Anyway, it's not happening. I don't know. No, uh, you can click on the share button, sir. Yeah. Uh, share and, window. Or tab. Yeah, and then you click on the first uh, screen that comes just below that. Uh, then it will be sharing your desktop. And if you can open this up in your desktop, we will be able to see. You should click on the window that comes just below when you click on share. No, no, it's not happening. <laughs> Share something else. Yeah, I think we saw your desktop, sir. So if you could open up that uh, slide on the desktop, then we should be able to see. I think we saw your saw your desktop. Yeah, yes, sir. We are able to see your desktop. So if you could open up the slide. Yeah, open up the slide, but. Yeah, we are not seeing the slides. We are seeing your Google ah. screen. Okay. That's what. It just one second. Yeah, there's some hitch there, glitch there. Sir, if you can WhatsApp that slide also, we can share it. Okay, later. Yeah, will it be fine, sir? You can WhatsApp to us. Uh, just one second, I am. You can send it to me, sir. I will share it with the team. Just one slide, I will send. You can just share it. Sure, sure, sure. Rupa, I'm just sending it to you. Otherwise, I think uh, Supreme Court slides were shared by both BCP sir and I think Mr. Joy had already shared. Same thing can come on, Mr. Uh, Singh can comment on that. Yeah, that that's brilliant. Oh, yeah. I just uh, one second. I will. Just one second. No, why it is not sharing? I don't know. Sir, uh, what we can Singh do, sir? Uh, Singh we can. Uh, Aagya. Aagya, sir. Agya. 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 Just. Sir. No, I am sending to Parshuraman. He can. Yeah, sir. What? Yeah, WhatsApp to me. Yeah, WhatsApp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. Yeah. Meanwhile, I can continue with my general uh, observations. Yep. Sir, uh, you Rupa, can share it to us, you. sir. Rupa, I have sent it to you. Yes, sir. We will present it, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have just sent you by WhatsApp. Please open it. Okay, okay. Sir. Yeah, as he keeps talking, I think you can open it. Yeah, now I have sent it already. 
so what i wanted to say that see uh, the judgment has come and this judgment is for those who have already paid in the provident fund and who have already contributed and there are three four categories of the employees regarding which this judgment is so i just wanted to clarify and so that everybody could benefit and locate themselves which category of employee as per the supreme court judgment he or she belongs to so that is uh, that was my intention so that's why i wanted to share that slide because this is very limited for limited categories of employees only yes yes sir it's come see as i i was just trying to explain this judgment is about four categories of employees the class of pensioners or potential pensioners the first are those who have retired after 2014 that's the broader category and the second category is those who have retired prior to 2014 among those who have retired after 2014 there are further two categories those have those who had exercised option prior to 14 employees who had exercised option under the proviso to para 11 3 this is little technical but this proviso is regarding option for higher pension prior to 2014 which proviso has now been deleted by the 2014 amendment so the first category is the employees who had exercised the option earlier and continued to be in service as on 1st september 2014 so as per the new amendment in which it, which it came in 2014 such people who had already exercised the option earlier and were getting higher pension prior to 2014 they were given 6 months time to exercise the fresh option so the current judgment says that uh, that same provision will apply that means for them the 6 months and another 6 months it was permissible to be extended by rpfc so for them that option is closed now because one year is already over and for them the scheme was uh, not under dispute it was uh, the amendment was not under challenge for the people who had already exercised the option and were getting the higher pension earlier than 2014 so that is the first category of employee who will be who will be guided by the amended uh, provisions of para uh, this paragraph 114 so they will this whatever time limit we have extended now will not apply to such class of pensioners who have already been part of that the second post amendment is that employees who had not exercised their option under the proviso to para 113 of the 95 scheme and we are continuing in service so the first category those who who had exercised the option and continued in service the second is those who had not exercised the option but continued in service so they will be entitled to exercise fresh option under para, para 11 4 of the post amendment scheme as a single option covering the pre amendment and the post amendment both options are still required but they can do it now so that is the one uh, time limit which has been extended now it is extended up to 26th june 2023 those who have retired prior to 14 there are still two categories there one is the employees who had retired prior to 14 without exercising an option they are not eligible for fresh option not entitled to the benefits of this judgment this i am simply reproducing the judgment the fourth category is the employees who had retired prior to 14 after exercising option under para 113 for higher pension but option was not accepted by the office though in the, for those who the option who the option we are already accepted they will be covered in the first uh, this thing option already accepted they will not be eligible for higher pension because their pension is already there now so, i mean the, the option uh, exercise but declined by office they will be eligible for fresh option and this will be covered by the rc gupta judgment which had come earlier in 2017 so
did we lose Mr. Singh uh, or is it my network? No, uh, we can't hear him. Yeah. Ah, we no, can't no. hear him. Sir, you've gone on mute, sir. Uh, you'll have to I, unmute yourself. Yes. So uh, the persons who have not exercised the option earlier and the reason is given in the judgment itself that because of the some uh, wrong interpretations, they could not exercise the option or if they exercise, it was not accepted like that. So let us give them fresh opportunities. So the 14, 2014 amendment, they did, uh, they had a time limit of six months, extended up to six months. That time limit is now extended further by the Supreme Court judgment. So that is the crux of the judgment, extension of the time limit. The judgment is basically more about uh, the entitlement of pension membership. And 80% uh, of the judgment deals with that. That when a, uh, when a pensioner or a member is having higher salary, because after 2014 amendment, we have excluded uh, those who, uh, whose salary was above 15,000 from becoming a member itself. Prior to 2014, there was no such a restriction. Everybody who was part of the PF member, uh, who was the part of the provident fund scheme, was also a pension member. Their contribution was limited up to 15,000, but membership was there. After 2014, the membership has been excluded. The coverage has been excluded for those who are having salary above 15,000 are not even entitled for membership. So this question was uh, dealt with in the Supreme Court judgment. This was disputed, but the Supreme Court, uh, the Honorable Supreme Court has said that this is correct. The government has all the powers to put extra conditions for becoming a member or remand coverage even after 15,000. So the power of the government is to amend the scheme anytime depending upon uh, the requirements of the scheme and as well as the various other factors. So that is what it has been done already. So I think we can remove the slide now and we'll just add this. Uh, Dr. Singh, actually, uh, Mr. Singh, uh, actually these points were discussed in the morning session. Okay, so the fine. two specific points that came today, since you are available, you know, one is uh, the formula of prorating, uh, which means uh, before 2014, uh, what uh, Saraswati ji was talking, and uh, employees retiring after 2014, where it is based on the last, uh, you know, five years uh, average salary and people retiring, you know, before 2014 based on the average salary of one year. And, you know, the overlapping period will be pro rata. You know, you know that kind of uh, discussion was there. But what I understand is uh, the formula itself is not updated. Whereas uh, the recent order from the commissioner, I think dated 6th of, uh, this month says that it is very clear that you know people retiring before 2014 is uh, you know last uh, one year salary and uh, after 2014 is last five years salary we would like to get some kind of input on this and see second, regarding uh, regarding yeah. regarding formula it is very clear that uh, formula is not permanent you know it depends upon various other factors and the formula can be changed Right now, the formula, what you are telling, it is already circular is there. So they have clarified how to calculate the benefit and they have also clarified how to calculate the contributions payable. But uh, the one thing we have to keep in mind that uh, in pro rata, the scheme is there. If you read uh, the scheme, the pro rata formula is there. Uh, uh, for uh, salaries or for service prior to 2014, we have this formula of uh, 6,500, that is the upper limit. And post 14, it is 2,000, uh, it is 15,000. That is five years of service and prior to that one year service. So that formula is there and that the same formula has been utilized here because the scheme provisions are there, are still there. So that same formula is being utilized there. So questions being asked by people and many people are actually getting scared regarding that undertaking in that uh, option form where uh, that government can change and uh, people are scared whether my amount will change or not. So I told you now it's not your amount or something, it's about the corpus. If the corpus is uh, growing, your pension will also go grow. If the corpus is not growing, the accordingly the decisions may be taken. I mean, that's why the undertaking is being taken so that nobody should, you know, later on start litigating that why my benefits are being changed. But the benefits depend upon the 
corpus and corpus is evaluated actually it is evaluated by actuary and based on that report only it is revised so but right now there is no such thing so nobody should feel scared at all whatever is your decision and it's optional actually see this is not mandatory it's all your optionals your money i have already been uh, paid in the provident fund they have already earned interest in the provident fund so the balance plus interest will come as it is whatever is the difference of uh, 9.49% of that salary so the fund wise it will come here now the question is that the same fund will not be returned at one go it has to be you know it, it will come back to you in a months and we don't know the future what will happen in the future so nobody is sure you know how long i will get the benefit and uh, it's a lot of depends upon uh, the longevity and a lot of issues are involved so a lot of calculations factors which are not in our control as on date those factors will also come in tomorrow so we don't know how to you know exact calculation of uh, because see, we have to understand one thing pension is not an investment scheme it is an insurance scheme so like any insurance scheme we have to see it from that view only so the more we try to look it like i invest something and i get it back something or not that question may not be the right question to be asked in this scheme because the scheme is entirely different the, the purpose is entirely different so the second point what uh, people are asking is the implementation speed like what the government i think what some thoughts telling that uh, next one month it will be implemented you know after 26th of june i think uh, july august onwards the pension will start coming to people that you can clarify sir and See, the current yes. pension scheme does not uh, you know address the inflation that is another question that is coming like no, the other regarding I inflation it. regarding inflation as i told you na it depends upon the corpus the fund is evaluated the valuation is done if the valuation is uh, good they call it uh, not inflation they call it additional relief that word you use is additional relief so for last many years it has not been announced but initially for few years it was announced also 4% reliefs like that some reliefs we are given so it all depends how the actuary report comes you know what is the valuation whether the corpus can take the further increase or not so that is totally beyond our uh, control as regarding this uh, deadline uh, it has been extended earlier also and uh, i was interacting with many people those who want i think today also somebody was uh, you know raising this point that the time limit is very short so it depends you know if uh, representations come if you can write to me also or any other office we are uh, ready to forward that representations regarding the timeline so that should not be a big issue at all depending upon the you know kind of representation we get so it may, it may be considered i am i am not saying that it will be considered only but i think we can forward it to the competent authority for consideration so time should not be an issue so the point is implementation sir when the people will start receiving the pension see we have already put on the website we are giving 20 days to you know take a scrutinize the application and take a call on it because it much depends upon the completeness of the data so many people who have been working since 95 probably those who have been working after 2010 and all the data are readily available prior to that the data availability we need to cross verify that may take so depending upon the completion of the application if it is complete it will not take time it will be done within 20 days because that is the time limit given to us but to getting the application completed and getting the proper documentations because we have to check for the misuse also so we have to see the data and the documents properly verify them properly if it is complete it will not processing will not take time the claim processing will not take time it will be done after the complete application within 20 days and that is the deadline we are given 20 days time it's very interesting sir i think uh, definitely we look forward to thank you sir yeah. thank you for thank you, thank you so much uh, thank you so much and now we can hear our senior commander anna sir also and then uh, i can sign off if you permit yeah, yeah. Uh, commander ji uh, narayan ji thank you think, sir uh, over to you i think your expert thoughts you know <laughs> very positive to have you so also. good morning i think with so many experts panel on the screen on the panel i, I think that there is very little i can add as such on the technicalities the only issue will be the the main challenge would be people trying to get their salary details from the time they were they become members because epfo will not be carrying those data with them post 2014 yes because came online and most of the data could be available prior to 
it is the employer's responsibility or the worker's responsibility to get the salary details on a month wise basis which is going not going to be that easy at least that's my look at it second aspect which i was looking at is uh, i can mr dk can also clarify mr singh can clarify and others may agree or may not agree with me my this thing is his prorata definition see the scheme say that there is a prorata pension coming under the proviso to in the scheme that they will pay prorata pension but when it comes to the what is the pensionable salary definition pensionable salary is just 15 months average salary under what authority anybody or any department can extend that yes prorata is for somebody who has worked for 2 years in the old scheme and 3 years in the new scheme yes prorata but those who have for those who are getting their retirement who has after serving for 60 months after 19 2014 where is the question of prorata the department is still continuing to adopt that prorata business in calculation of pension which according to me is not a right aspect because they are going beyond the law which says that it is 60 month 60 month plus one year is not there madam it is 48 months plus 12 months yes i agree or proportionately but 60 plus and 70 months i don't think is a right but uh, yes that's what the department is following and it's for the other legal experts on the panel to say whether they agree with me or not that's my take on that somebody extending the definition of pensionable salary definition of pensionable salary is sf 60 months average of 60 months now how do you extend 60 months to 70 months 48 and 12 i understand the overall limit should be 60 months both prior to 2014 and post 2014 it should be 60 months it cannot be 60 months in post scenario plus another 10 months for the pre 2014 so that becomes an extension of the uh, total uh, scheme provision that my understanding that has some uh, clarification needed i have been trying to seek clarification but i am not getting So now it's up to the concerned authority. So now you're right, actually, sir. Actually, uh, add, in practice, uh, when employees are claiming even under the limited wage ceiling That's scenario, even, and yeah. then I am talking even about the without going into the higher pension. Yes, this is being adopted in the current pension calculation, which I feel that is not a right formula, which yes. needs appropriate representation to get it corrected. So there are unless some. More- one more point yes, sir. same question the pensionable year of service what people have been asking whether that should be added to you know 2014 period people completing 20 years or it will be added to the current period you understand the point so the two years what you add after completing 20 years of service whether it should be added on the 2014 sir, question they, or the, the current question what the department what the department currently do, is doing is they are taking two years weightage for the pre 2014 service their pre 2014 service that is on 6500 that is the weightage given under the current calculation but this formula of 10 months or 60 months will not make any difference for people who have been who yeah. are eligible who have been who are going to get pension prior to that more than that that may not make a difference if the salary does not go below 15000 for a long time because they are already getting on a higher salary it means that they would have been above the statutory limit so it will not make any difference but the difference is made for those who are drawing pension on the current salaries and this extension i feel is i don't know bcp sir can uh, correct me if i am wrong legally are is the department is on the right foot when they extend the definition of uh, weightage which specifically says 60 months 60 months cannot be extended according to me thank you sir thank you very much Indeed. you are really that's right. my take on it i i am sure dk will not agree because that the department's uh, <laughs> uh, 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 department has implemented the orders that they, they take separately they no, calculate no, so just one uh, one thing this point of uh, when it was you know this this was also under challenge when uh, earlier formula was average of 12 months and this was increased to 60 months this was also challenged before the supreme court Correct. and the same judgment covers the logic behind extending and there the argument was 
that uh, you know somebody may fall sick towards the end of the career so if you take only one last 12 months salary his pension may go down because he was not getting the full salary so that was the logic given to extend from 12 months to the 60 months the logic behind pro rata is the performance of the corpus see there is actually report and they find out how the fund goes in deficit what are the reasons for the fund for going into the deficit so in 2001 when the this uh, limit was uh, enhanced from rupees 5000 to 6500 it was done in 2001 till 2001 the pension fund was in you know, the last profit was almost around 30 crores as soon as the formula was this was increased this, uh, this limit was increased from 5000 to 6500 in one year the valuation was done in one year the deficit went to 17000 crores so you know it was discussed at various level and one of the reason was cited ki since you are uh, collecting contributions at a lower salary and giving benefit on a higher salary disproportionately so you need to do it pro rata if you want to manage the fund properly so that was the logic behind it but of course you know it it may be beneficial for somebody it may not be beneficial for somebody else that's why i am saying it's a collective fund and we cannot have it one to one calculation regarding your contribution and benefit it's an overall contribution and overall benefits that's the nature of the fund thank you sir he, okay sir here can i can i just comment on what mr singh has said earlier the, the earlier hike from 6 of 5000 6500 the average salary pension salary remained at 12 12 month salary that's where the pension fund took a hit like somebody who contributed 12 at for 12 months at the higher rate for 6500 he would get pension on his total service on that to cover that gap to cover that uh, loss which made this time they made it mandatory to cover that they made it 60 months and 60 months there again they said pro rata yes pro rata will be within the 60 months you are getting Two years in the old scheme, three years under the new scheme. I have no issues on that, but that should be within the 60 months and not beyond the 60 months. The 60 months is a formula which is accepted, admitted, and it's not denied or disputed anywhere. You can't go beyond 60 months. Within 60 months, pro rata is possible. Like where you have two years and three years, one year and four years. Once you cross that threshold of 60 months, the pro rata does not apply. That's my take at it and i know you, you uh, legally Sir, somebody has Sir, to actually, look at it narayan sir actually there is a notification on 16 2023 this is yes, uh, by uh, aparjita jaggi sir regional pf commissioner it's a uh, available it's a uh, you know official notification i will read the notification it says very clearly people retiring before 2014 then it will be for that uh, you know last uh, one year period and people retiring after 2014 it is the last 5 years it is very crystal but what it does come but what department is doing is sir what department is doing is that people retiring after contributing for 60 months after 2014 even then the pro rata is being adopted but, but the circular is very crystal clear yeah, that that you need to check sir that you need to take up with the department Yeah, yeah. I think uh, that is what I think we may need uh, some clarification from Mr. Singh. I think the circular yes. what it says I is very crystal clear. Even Mr. Singh may not be able to clarify that. You need to take up at a much higher level, sir. No, no. I That's understand. a policy decision. That's so a policy this, decision. You and I can't change it. Lot of I, either we either we get a legal either we get a legal decision in our favor or we accept what they are doing. You no, know, what I understand is you know this uh, circular is uh, very sacrosanct. Many people are asking us. all our member companies you know based on this circular you know it is very clear then why are we discussing about the pro rata i think uh, we need some clarification for industry point of view sir I please share the circular with me i also look up at the website but if you you share the circular with I, me i will do that sir right away i will do that i um, i wanted a, i wanted a bcp sir's uh, opinion on this a uh, legal part whether legally is the department right in doing it sir in fact uh, as far as uh, <clears throat> uh, provisions of the scheme and uh, act is concerned uh, there is uh, always uh, this is section 6a read with the schedule 3 so the government has power to amend uh, any of the uh, 
points of the scheme. That's why 2014 prior and subsequent it has been amended and that has been upheld by the Supreme Court also. So according to me, there is a provision to uh, issue amendments by the government by amend amending the scheme in the act itself. And okay. Saraswati, can we take some audience questions uh, that are in the chat, please? Certainly, um, Hoge, and I'm sure it will be it will be benefiting everybody. I think one question that has uh, come uh, uh, is maybe I'll just go from what is there in the chat, where employees who opt for pension on higher wages, will they get arrears of pension from the date of attaining the age of 58 till date? So this is for those who already retired and are drawing pension, provided it has happened after 1st September 2014. Will there be arrears paid on the higher pension? I believe the answer is yes, but uh, if we could just get that clarified. From the, the date of retirement, they will get it. Correct. Um, the other question that is uh, that is coming in is um, again on the 26.6 and BCP, sir, you talked about it. Uh, so the question that comes up, uh, comes, comes up is if there is no specific option that has been exercised um, under para 26.6, then where, do, where does the application stand? From a practical perspective, since the, com the corporates have already made higher contributions, administrative charges have been paid on higher pay and so on, how will the EPFO process that? That's a question that's coming up, sir. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Singh, if you could take that. And no, what is the question? The question is on the option to be exercised under para 26.6 of the EPFO yes, scheme, uh, PF scheme, sir. Uh, that is one of the conditions for making a higher contribution. So in practice, employers would not have um, filed the application under para 26.6, but higher contributions would have been made. Administrative charges would have been paid on higher pay. So uh, in practice, there is a contribution that has already gone in. So from a higher pension perspective, how, do, how does this pan out as a question? This, uh, this clarification is already there on the uh, circular has already come on it. The detailed circular has come. So I will request. I think it is the, already cleared, I think. Yes, you, you can go through that. The things have been relaxed now. Of course, see, para 26.6, we have to understand it two ways. And that's why I keep emphasizing, you know, we should go back to the design of the scheme. The scheme was a restricted membership scheme. The provident fund scheme was not an universal scheme. All employees in the companies were not required to be enrolled. They were not entitled to be enrolled. Only those employees, because there was a concept of excluded employees. Means if your salary is above 15,000, you cannot even become a member. Not to say of contribution. Contribution will come only after you become a member. So first eligibility is that you are you have to be have you have to have a monthly basic and DA below 15, uh, 6,500 or 15,000. That is the uh, scheme is designed for that. Those whose salary was higher, they were excluded from the membership. Now the 26.6 was on option where one by one, because it was kind of, you know, classification. Classification based on a salary limit, base ceiling. So those below the base ceiling will become member. Those above the base ceiling will not become a member. Out of the excluded class, one by one, individually, depending upon the request and the options and undertaking, because see, in those cases, those who are not entitled to become member, the employer is not responsible for any statutory compliance. So when you become a member, you have to give an undertaking. Para 26.6 is not just about permission. It also says employer has to give an undertaking that employer will make all the statutory compliance in respect of such excluded employees regarding whom they had no liability earlier. So employer is taking a liability and the liability to comply. A statutory compliance involves filing returns, nominations, a lot of things are there, not just contribution. So see the paying contribution, contribution goes to the fund. The scheme is, scheme is different from the fund. We have to understand this. So first you have to become a member of the fund. Uh, member of the scheme in the fund some erroneous payments can also come fund is fund of course is there you have contributed and that higher uh, wages have uh, higher uh, administration charges might have been paid which are which we are also trying to verify because one of the condition is that while we are processing this we have to verify that also 
So all these will be there. So once you understand the difference between the provident fund scheme and the provident fund, I think this confusion may not be there. But right now on para 26, there is a good clarification which is there on the you know publicly available. So I think that will take care of most of the hindrances while applying for uh, fresh options uh, under the present scenario. Right, sir. Thank you so much for that clarification. Uh, there are some questions. Maybe I can respond uh, just in the interest of time. And if uh, anybody would want to add on, please do that, sir. Uh, so whether the timeline of 26 6 20, 2023 is applicable for employer also to complete and upload the salary details into the portal? The answer is no. This is for employees to make their uploading of uh, and, and exercise their option. And after that, the uh, email will go to the employer for completing their details. Uh, Will employees who opt for pension on higher wages get arrears? I think we've hand answered this question. Uh, there is another question which which says that uh, there is no facility to add scheme certificate in the EPFO portal. As a result, employees could not disclose their past service details of higher pension. So this is a question that has come from uh, Mr. Krishnarajan TTK Prestige. Uh, any comments on this, sir? Uh, I'm not clear whether it's See, this best. time limit. Uh, time limit is you know the option has to reach to the PF office before 26 June, and option will not reach PF office unless employer appro uh, approves it or rejects it, whatever. Unless employer signs it digitally and send it to us. So to say that the employee can file and employer cannot uh, you know keep it pending for long is not correct. Employer will have to either approve it or reject it yeah. so that it can come to us before 26 6. So, just that an employee submits an option form, it is pending with the employer. After 26 6, 6 employer also cannot do, it, do that. So, let us be very clear about that. So, it's not just. No, no, this is a very, very important point you have brought, Singh. Mr. Singh. Yes, Actually, yes. this which means currently people think that once they make a filing and get an acknowledgement number, I think they are with it. They are uh, completed. But what you are trying to say is, unless the employer approves that, it is not complete. See, because the definition is a joint option. It's not just an employee option. It has to be, you know, given consent by the employer. The option will not become joint unless employer is there also involved into it. But this is a very important clarification, sir. And I details. think what will happen? I think the that, sir, this means employees have to come in much earlier than 26-6 to give that window of approval by the employer. So 26, if, if an employee files on 26-6 employer, some of the employers may be possible for them to do it on the same day, but most of them will not be able to do it if the load is high. So the employers then will have to go back and tell their employees that they have to come in earlier. Oh, sir, a very, very okay. important point you raised. Thank you so much. But, but the we'll question is, all our members. though the instructions came only on 14-6, not earlier. So between 46 and 26, there's no time at all. So therefore, it has got to be extended. That's my submission. People are making representation, I think. Already some uh, representations have come, I believe. Sir, one general question, I sir. Uh, initially, government said 5,50,000 crores is the outgo if the schemes get implemented in full sense, 100%. But uh, current uh, ongoing rate, what is the image, sir, approximately? What percentage of people are gone for that? I think already 18 lakh people have applied. I think almost lakh, 17 sir. or 18, 1 8. I think 1 8 lakh, those who have applied, see, everybody will not apply. So yeah. we cannot make a general, uh, we cannot presume that 100% people will go for this. Absolutely. So it depends upon how many people are coming or choosing this option. So, so, so far, 5 lakh 50,000 crores was based on 100%. So, so that is discussed in the judgment of, itself. See, that is discussed in the judgment itself. The judgment itself is saying you are assuming that everybody will come to you for this. So that is what, uh, you know, it is discussed in the judgment. This, uh, this is based on the assumptions. Of course, all the estimate is based on assumptions only. So actual, what will be the actual workload? Then we will come to know what will be the impact. What is the total people? Think what is the, how many minutes? Total, so far, they have it's said it's one one. 17 lakh applied, huh? 17 lakh already applied, is saying. 17 or 18 lakh. No, 17 out of how many eligible people, sir? Any statistics available? That are still, they have not worked out actually. But few cases after this uh, last circular of 26, 6, now, few cases have now yeah. been found eligible. All over country, I am not aware of the number. 
in my office i am not having that much uh, so we have so we want to get a ballpark number some 10% 20% 30% from the organizations also we see it is not a big number still many people have not opted for it you know even the bigger organizations some offices because of the change in interest rate scenario sir that's because of the change in interest rate scenario so that the interest being offered by the banks now have gone up from 4 5% to 8.8 8 and above for the senior citizens look at the return on what you're going to transfer and what you're going to get how is it uh, really a financially viable depending on the financial literacy of the member who's uh, opting for it so not not all may opt sir that's my take on that not all may opt because there may be many people who would say that i would i would be a better investment manager than and since yeah, so point two is the bank approved rate very well sir nps is sir, bank well. approved is 8% plus so bank approved is 8 plus 8% plus so obviously the returns on the investments outside could also be proportionately higher so yes it's something which is for life so one needs to look at it in fact there was a recent news sir nps also they are extending up to 75 years of age whatever you are supposed to commute 60% tax free i think they are allowing you to you know remove it in uh, monthly or yearly way up to the age of 75 so nps is closely competing with uh, you know employees pension scheme so so government has got so there you know, are two, right? <laughs> two different sir there are two different things which are which cannot be compared exactly but yeah there are two different uh, schemes not not to be compared thank you thank you so much thanks a lot anything else sir Okay. I, I think only uh, one point from my side, yeah. sir. Uh, the actually the risk, sir, it is not a general scheme, which means a person case by case we have to weigh the pros and cons. What is yeah. good for one person, my my food is another man's poison. I think that kind of uh, you know each individual has to calculate. For example, people who are retired in 2015, just immediately after 2014, they have got the maximum yield because yes. they will be getting the arrears now. but people are retiring from now on i think the risk is definitely they have to calculate depending on their health conditions <clears throat> depending on their you know a number of periods of service and what is the payback period you know now the calculator is very clearly available so you can key in and get the payback period so i think it's a very case by case you cannot generalize like any other scheme so person to person it is completely different Yeah, right. and we are comparing the pf which is a defined contribution scheme to the pension which is a defined benefit scheme so clearly you no know, there is uh, no a trade off or there is no percentage which we can arrive at saying that if this is it uh, you cannot have a formula uh, which again is a big caution i think we need to call out maybe sir one question uh, i had in my mind is we are calling this option as a reversible option one this option made is mm -hmm. made we stay with it but the option may be exercised on the understanding that i am getting pension based on the average of 60 months no pensionable salary would be considered as average of 60 months so in the even the government makes a change then would there be a reversal that is permitted is something that uh, i had a question sir because clearly we are saying that uh, uh, today if i make a decision it is based on the formula that is available today so is there any possible reversal though the supreme court does not there, talk about it there where have you got this that it is irreversible this the option once exercised i will have to contribute and uh, then there is no uh, i cannot go back and change reverse the contribution again no sir no see that contribution is different if you contribute of course that is different but uh, so so far as this in this context the present context of supreme court judgment and this joint options we have not come out with uh, any this thing clarification that it is irreversible or something so no, once i, I make a higher contribution to pension at a later point in time can i reverse it back to pf account see, sir see, that is that's what i'm telling that is a call which we have to clarify at what a stage it will be taken as irreversible suppose i have started already the pension see my understanding is that or whatever is the traditional view that option one exercise is final but uh, see in what at what point how do you define option exercised 
at what point you will say that it is option exercised in this case you have uh, we, right now you have submitted some options we are sending some clarificatory or whatever documents additional documents we need and uh, still the money has not come so we need to you know define what is this means option exercise is final okay but what is meant by option exercise i so, that i understand sir so, that so i understand so that okay. at this point it is irreversible it may not be i mean the correct position at in my opinion no so, i understand sir i understand your point that you're saying that today it is not irreversible till i actually make the payment but my point is say within a month the employer gives a clarification the epfo confirms with a number as to what has to move from pf to pension and thereafter if a, there is a change in the pension formula then there is a, a financial impact on employees that is a point i'm trying to bring out madam 266 is not irreversible you give 266 today after a period of some time you can say that i don't want to contribute on higher wages you can come back to the statutory wages so 20, if you go by 266 saying that it is irreversible i don't know uh, what what mr singh said once your pension has started you then you cannot go back and saying that uh, you will reverse at that point of time no before you start getting a pension at some point of time you want possibilities are there but once you start you are eligible you had cut off date after 58 so assuming you retired at 58 and then you want to change your option sorry it won't be Understand. because you become eligible for a benefit based on the option exercised after the benefit is crystallized you cannot say no i don't want this benefit because i am going to get a better benefit if i go back now on hindsight you cannot change prospectively before you are eligible at some point of time 266 is not final ma'am you can change 266 at any point of time it's like a voluntary contribution which you stop after some time if say i want to contribute only at statutory wages that's available at any point of time both employer and employee can restrict even employer who has given a 26 option today saying that i am willing to contribute on full wages at some point he comes back and says that i am willing to contribute only on statutory limit it is possible that option continues to remain the right of employer to restrict at any point of time remains he can come back and say i won't contribute so uh, yes sir the only worry is the higher amount would have gone to the pension corpus so yes. that would not be reversible as you said The, the, the past contribution. Can I get? I, I hope yes. the department will come out to come out with a clarification saying that for the period for which you contributed higher, you will be treated. Uh, uh, you will get a higher pension pro rata, and for the period you contribute on statutory, oh. yeah, already a pro rata scheme is there. So you start being calculating your pension pro rata. That's a possibility. I look at it. Yeah. Got it. Yes. Not be right. I'm not. I'm presuming that that possibility. I understand. Yes. It is not based on what is there today, but it is a suggestion. or a possibility a that you, yeah, because correct. the 266 is not final 266 can be reversed at any point of time during your service understand sir so now there is clear i think we are really uh, yes sir bcp sir you had uh, something to add i was just being conscious of time uh, uh, now there is clarity regarding uh, reversing the uh, reversing the option in fact uh, once it goes to pension fund So what whether we can reverse it or not, the department has to come with the clarification. My suggestion is, sir, from the industry side, and uh, uh, the same clarification can be sought from the organization from industry bodies. Then possibility of getting a reply would be higher. When an individual makes, we don't think we will be able to get such replies. Uh, right. I think the industry bodies. can take such a representation to the organization maybe we get some clarity on that exactly we will do it sir makes sense that that will be the best things you know because here uh, you know it's a, it's a very legal stand which we need to take and it, it's a policy decision actually exactly. so right. it's, uh, it's so it may not be proper for us to <laughs> make yeah. any comments on that I understand uh, sir understand that sir my suggestions now because i am outside the department i'm free to make whereas mr singh will be covered by <laughs> the rules and regulations which are in place i am a free man now as a retired officer i can say anything and get away with it he will not be able to do so i can be little more liberal in saying that these are possible and these are not possible whereas he would not say unless he has a something in writing from the department exactly you are right you are right we appreciate that Uh, so, Mr. Parishraman, do you want to uh, provide the closing comments? No, I think uh, today. Oh, no, thank you so much. I think I have the, uh, you know, interest of time. 
I don't want to, but I think the clearly uh, the complexities are very clear. See, as uh, we discussed today, you know, multiple years of service in multiple organizations. I think this is a big challenge. Availability of records, I think, is another uh, big challenge. And again, uh, you know, the company started uh, in certain contribution at a point of time. Then they changed it when employees shifted. For example, when employees working in an organization where they were, uh, you know, contributing on a statutory limits. Then you moved to another organization, B, they started paying on a higher pension. So these kind of cases are really going to jam the system. So there is no yes or uh, no for this. And the current uh, system yeah. does not uh, yeah, you know, address yeah. inflation, which is another important thing, because uh, today we are fine, but the net present value of money after five years or 10 years, this money is nothing actually. Unless inflation adjustments are happening. But Mr. Singh was telling it is a kind of a corpus fund. It is like Pacific Ocean, right? You know, it has to become, uh, you know, it has to grow of its own. So that's a challenge. So I think uh, it's not so simple prima facie. I think that's why I said each individual has to work out the pros and cons. And there is no magic mantra for this. And there is no right answer. In fact, it is like MBA. Anything is good. Anything is right. Anything is wrong. You know, there is nothing called right or wrong in management. So now only the time will tell. So therefore, I think it's very, very difficult to give a very general answer for this. But uh, today we got a very, very important takeaway from both Mr. Swing and Mr. Kama. I think uh, the organizations need to file the 26 bar 6 on before 26. I think this communication is very, very, uh, you know, uh, weak at this point of time. I think uh, I would strongly suggest... Uh, Chairman of uh, Karnataka Employees Association, Mr. B.C. Prabhaka, I think to issue a circular from your office sir, to all the organizations. I think yeah. that uh, this is uh, mandatory and uh, even if employees have filed and taken the acknowledgement, it doesn't stand the test of time. I think uh, this is a very, very important communication. And secondly, the implementation, what we heard from Mr. Singh is very, very fast, 20 days. I think it's... Uh, but uh, given these kind of complications, you know, maybe individuals, I think it will go faster where the route is very clear. Otherwise, uh, today, really, thank you so much, uh, Augustus G, uh, Saraswati G, Mr. Prabhaka, the entire uh, panelists, and Mr. Narayan Kamar and, uh, you know, Mr. Singh for your wonderful time. They came at a very, very close uh, short notice. In fact, I was talking to Mr. Singh. He immediately accepted our uh, invitation. Same thing to Mr. Narayan Kamar. Sir, thank you, sir. You are really uh, made a lot of uh, new concepts very clear to us. Thank you so much. That's all from me. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Night. night, getting back to all, all, all old Saraswati, uh, Augustus, uh, whom I had interacted with in the service, and Mr. DK. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your nice, kind words, nice sir. To, nice, to see, touch. nice to see you all back. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. BC sir, I've been meeting and I've been interacting with him for many years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.